Hi, thank you for taking your time and, and welcome back to API Day Singapore. Uh, good afternoon. I'm joining with Satya, uh, my colleague from Red Hat. And in this session, we'll cover uh, protecting and securing core banking APIs with Red Hat API management. So this is a, such an interesting topic. Uh, so Satya, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I uh, hope, uh, hope you can see me now. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Satya here, uh, joining from London. Uh, I am, uh, along with Rafael, I work with Red Hat. I'm part of the uh, API and integration team. Uh, and uh, together, we will uh, hope to take you through this session and uh, a, a demo at the end. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Satya. So, uh, and, and me, about me. So, my name is Rafael Marins. Uh, I work for Red Hat Financial Services Business Unit as Technical Product Market Manager. And so, let's get started. And today, we we'll cover uh, protecting core banking APIs. And we start about talking about uh, the context around banking, core banking and systems and this core banking modernization, the building blocks, before jumping into the open APIs uh, view. And, and, and then uh, also part of the workshop to demonstrate uh, the, the tooling around uh, to, to publish uh, open APIs in the standard APIs. But then I will hand over to back to Satya that will uh, present the, 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 the last part of this workshop uh, for protecting and securing API. So moving on. Uh, the central positioning of core banking systems make then one, one of the most critical components of in the overall banking architecture. So any change in the core systems will have impact through how the channels and operations so historically, completely replacing the core was the only, on, only upgrade option and, and making a core banking platform upgrade a bet to the bank decision, you know. So this is not just uh, a, about Red Hat definition. Uh, it's also how Gardner defines core banking. And if it still holds true, uh, then core banking is certainly under pressure from a range of rapid pace chains and, and circulating it. So, and I have uh, some sentence about this. Uh, a few years ago, the company was the center of the universe and the customers around it and accessing the different offers that this business had to offer and what what we saw was a radic radical change and healthy and vital change, a change in the mindset to understand that the customer is, is in the center of the universe and our companies are floating around, orbiting around the customer. So this is not also be, it's, it's recently said by chairman and CEO of uh, largest bank in Brazil, one of them. and. Moving on, the institutions are aware uh, that these systems required some level of modernization, but until recently, they have found themselves looking at ma massive investments of time, effort, and money. And replacing the course banking systems was an expensive undertaking that often could not demonstrate a return on the investment in the short term. So a full replacement could be a multi-year effort and a significant resource commitment. And there is also considerable operational risk involved due to the transformation complexity and the potential disruption of the day-to-day -day operations. So continuing to introduction to the new banking products, channels, and technologies increase the complexities and necessities that the modernization of the old legacy core banking systems and 
a combination of internal ex external drivers is is what uh, is at, at play right now so openness will be a defining characteristic of the technology and the culture driving success in in the core and this three pictures show the level of interdependency and modularity of core banking business capabilities in the as is state but also possibilities of the future state and it's a matrix of different lines of business in, in the columns uh, cross it with the supporting organization structure so the departments and, and business units so the future of banking is challenging this status quo of for legacy core banking systems and banking needs to move from the classic mainframe based legacy systems large monoliths and focus only on real reliability and but most banks still contend with digital and legacy and the answer for many of firms is to outsource is what we see in the second picture and to streamline architecture as an inter intermediary model like in the center we show in the center and they will be looking into a streamline architecture uh, mostly vendor provide with significant outsource of back office process high rate, high rates uh, of straight through processing and also eliminating uh, most manual tasks and many banks are beginning to rethink the traditional view of the internal development realizing that fostering a health partner ecosystem is a competitive necessity need so the idea is to streamline architecture to enable integration solutions from the smart service providers wherein it is easy to bring on new partners and equally simple to switch them out for another as needs change so the back office becomes more a supply chain of services nearing full automation in some parts of parts even so achieving this is where banks becomes more modular and and service and and not service provider and banks that struggle to develop modular services will be needed to by the development of differentiation models and competitive advantage so we believe that containers and, and a trusted enterprise kubernetes and devops are the key ingredients uh, that a modern platform should be based on that allows you to transform into modular digital bank build cloud native applications and also employs analytics manage machine learning and serverless applications so uh, Open platform needs to provide a consistent way for both developers and operations teams to collaborate across deployment foot footprints from edge and air gap environments to infrastructure you have in your own data center and all the way to the hybrid cloud. So it helps to simplify the core banking modernization effort while improving your resilience. And with the monolith, you have a reliable secure stack of functions when you your application calls calls that function but when you move the monolith to microservices you are trading the reliability of the secure call stack for the unreliability and insecure network and this is the view of modular business uh, uh business modules inside the bank uh, that comprise and provides elemental business capabilities that can be packaged as as a, as a service uh, and is comprised by many others microservices and needs different aspects that we show here in terms of observability api manager API gateway, but also discover, discover uh, security and, and deploy, deployment automation. So moving on to the context of APIs in banking. 
this is how containers simplify, can simplify application and API deployment uh, and portability acro across platforms. This is how we at Red Hat we see. And this eliminates the need to refactor services to launch them and differentiate in different uh, infrastructure and make your environment more efficient. So in this open API platform that you, you, are, you see now, uh, Red Hat OpenShift serves as the underlying container platform. But uh, in, on top of this, you have TrueScale API Manager and also Fuse for the integration components and the authorization servers based on Red Hat single sign-on and many other aspects of integration, like even streaming, but based on AMQ streams, uh, based on Kafka. And Red Hat developed and made available the FSI Open API Sandbox, which is an open source toolkit to accelerate the mock-up and the experimentation of Open API's lifecycle. And you can see this for you. You can use this for your um, your development or proof of concept. But uh, the in general the idea is that you have package with these with a set of capabilities, starting with uh, standard open APIs from UK standards that you get it and, and mock up. And I'll show you now very quickly. Uh, how it works. So basically, this is uh, OpenShift environment we are we are using for this workshop, uh, and I'm using this shared with Satya. And basically, this is the initial overview. And as part of this, uh, you have the ability to use operators. With operators, uh, it's all automatically provisioned by using the Red Hat Open API sandbox, uh, including the Red Hat tree scale and as part of the tree scale uh, you have the ability to deploy the api as custom resource definition files so this is this is a, a, a important capability you have to to deploy your apis and keep your apis uh, in the CI CD pipeline and have this all, all these automated through your uh, automation DevOps. Uh, looking into the front end of this open API sandbox, I have previously uh, registered a user that I used to log, in, log on now. And after logging in, uh, so our each back. So now I'm logged in and I can navigate through the catalog. And based on the catalog, I can explore the existing and available APIs uh, offered and provided to this developer portal. And clicking on, I can navigate through uh, the, the multiple APIs and do a test on these APIs like this one or the branch locator. And all these APIs are based on, on mock-up services, which you don't really need to, uh, to implement the endpoint initially as part of your API lifecycle, but actually uh, use MicroRocks as the API mocking uh, service. So, here you can see the API, TreeScale API management uh, admin portal. It's the backend where you see all the APIs that we are using and the branch locator one, which you just make some calls. And this is pointing to uh, a backend configuration to that goes to, to MicroRocks into the same work environment. And MicroRox provides uh, all the six APIs, including the branch locator uh, data. 
and this is how in general it works so long story short uh i just want to also to present to you the the source repository for the open api sandbox uh it's available on open accelerators at github and this is what we provide by automatically to provisioning this environment on 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 at your will on your cloud environment on prem or your working development workstation and you have you can fill up uh, issues if you have any questions about and and contribute and communicate as part of the community so now i'll hand over to uh satya that will continue as part of the presentation Satya, can't hear you. Oh, it's coming. Yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, trying to share my screen now. I hope you can see it. Can see, yeah. OK, perfect. Perfect. OK, uh, thank you so much, uh, Rafael, uh, for that uh, very good uh, introduction to open banking and uh, modernization. So what we are going to talk about is we have what we have seen so far is, uh, you know, you have uh, a, a monolithic uh, core banking, which you have broken up and uh, you are adopting good practices, uh, modern practices like containers and cloud native uh, application development and API management, right? So the question comes, how do you fit in all of the different aspects uh, of how you used to reach out to your uh, customers, your partners, and your uh, uh, your uh, affiliates using uh, you know your uh, modern technology, right? So what we are going to talk about now is if your modern app is developed uh, in a microservice architecture uh, in a cloud native environment you would most probably have to use uh, service mesh uh, for managing that uh, communication and networking between uh, those uh, different services. And then we will see where API management can come in and help you uh, with uh, the outreach to your to uh, a larger uh, uh, set of consumers for your applications, for your services, okay? So here, if you see, uh, uh, you know, uh, capabilities of service mesh and API management, there are uh, a bit of an overlap, uh, particularly in terms of uh, access control, in terms of policies, uh, setting uh, limits on the usage of the services and in security. Right? But uh, if we dig a little bit further, we see that they serve different purposes. API management is mainly to manage your relationship between your API consumers and API producers. So the target, when you need to think about APIs is, uh, you know, what do I need to do to reach out to my consumers of my API, right? I need to provide uh, documentation, including uh, open API or uh, Swagger uh, UI, need to provide a developer portal, set up uh, some sort of monetization, have formal API contracts and set up a partner ecosystem. These are the kind of aspects that I want to look for when I'm trying to reach out to a larger audience uh, for my uh, APIs. With service mesh, you are more uh, concerned with uh, uh, you know, traffic control, uh, providing that security observability across your cloud native applications, because now your uh, uh, single request can pass through tens or even hundreds of different services. So you need that ability to uh, discover services uh, that are available within your clusters, uh, provide uh, quick traffic management, uh, you know, provide uh, uh, a way to do uh, traffic control across versions, observability. So this is more, uh, more uh, geared towards your developers and your DevOps engineers to manage uh, their uh, development lifecycle and to, uh, and to create that uh, environment for, of uh, you know, a microservice architecture for you. Okay, so as I said, the key takeaway is 
Uh, with API management, you are managing that relationship between your consumers and producers. Whereas with service mesh, it's about uh, delivering that uh, more uh, uh, more hand uh, more uh, uh, management control, uh, security, and observability within your uh, cloud native application. Okay. So, uh, how do we talk about managing APIs for external customers, right? Uh, suppose we have uh, a lot of uh, API backends uh, for uh, for my different uh, uh, applications that I want to expose, right? For my maybe my payment executions, my current accounts, customer eligibility, customer offers, etc. Now I would need to package them into different uh, different sets of products for them to be consumed by different consumers, right? So. Uh, so instead of re-architecting my solution around what my consumers need, I would architect my backends uh, as a, a set of micro uh, with my microservice architecture, and I would choose to expose these backends uh, as uh, a, as uh, uh, you know as routes into my uh, API backend, and then in my API product, I would define the different uh, packaging of the uh, backends that go together. Uh, and uh, the application plans that I could provide them with, uh, and the different uh, uh, consumers that they could that could subscribe to the plan. So here in the API management is where I could control uh, who can access what. So for example, for my website, I would have a read-only plan, and uh, it concerns the banking ecosystem for uh, for the consumers too, uh, for your maybe your uh, banking customers to come in and. Uh, uh, and explore their own uh, uh, account and uh, you know offers and payments and things like that. Whereas uh, for uh, a fintech uh, which is uh, a, a partner for me, I would provide uh, uh, information uh, about uh, a, a distribution capability, uh, maybe their uh, their resellers of my loans or resellers of my uh, credit card products so they would need to see what the offers are what the eligibilities are so that is how i would package things okay so that's how an api management api management uh, like three scale can help you package and secure your backend apis uh, and uh, uh, deliver them to the right consumers Okay, so now the question becomes: uh, If I have architected my backend services as as, as uh, with a microservice architecture, I would have these uh, different microservice groups, right? So maybe the group A is uh, the current account that we talked about. Group B is the customer offers that we talked about, and there are group C, group D, and so on, right? And then there could uh, there would be. Uh, most microservices would have a communication that is limited to within their uh, particular uh, microservice group but then there could also be traffic flowing between different microservices you know because you could reach out to a different microservice to get uh, a certain information that you want to include in your microservice uh, response or as part of your business use case so typically when we talk about uh, the traffic uh, and uh, the flow of traffic between uh, your uh, service groups uh, we introduce the concepts of having north south and an east west management structure so your north south management tells you that you know there are consumers that are consuming your apis uh, uh, you know which are secured uh, and available typically outside a boundary, which may be an enterprise boundary or a, a domain boundary. And east-west management is more about uh, traffic that flows across uh, uh, the, the different uh, microservices directly. So uh, what are those things? So we will talk about uh, uh, the, you know, like I said, it's about either the traffic that flows between uh, two microservices within the same domain group or uh, microservices that need to talk to each other across domain group, but using the microservice protocols. 
so now we come to when we have this kind of uh, an, uh, a, a service uh, a service architecture and uh, traffic flowing both north and south and east and west how do you secure your apis right so uh, we need to think about what is interdomain traffic and what is intradomain traffic right what is interdomain is what flows between different domains or outside the even your enterprise boundary Okay, so typically you would provide one entry point to your uh, uh, microservice, uh, microservices, right? So you have a set of services that you have uh, created. Uh, typically what you would do is you would create one ingress entry point uh, and then that would be the gateway to your microservices and that will control the, uh, the, uh, the rules for uh, communication with uh, the rest of the microservices uh, in the same group. And you need to have different roles for different consumer groups. So as we have seen, maybe uh, there are uh, certain groups of users that would need, uh, uh, you know, certain level of access, like a read-write access, but you want to limit uh, access to read-only for certain methods for certain users. Okay, so what you need here is both authorization uh, as well as authentication. And the contracts need to be more formal because you are, uh, coming, you are uh, sharing your uh, services with external consumers. They don't know uh, anything about uh, your implementation. They don't have access to your code base. They don't have access to uh, uh, to the engineers uh, and and uh, you know your internal systems, right? So they depend on what are called formal contracts. So uh, you need to publish uh, documentation of your APIs. You need to have an ability for them to consume uh, and try out those APIs using mocks or using the end endpoints and see what the request and response schema types are. And you need to guide them to discover the different plans and the different APIs that you are exposing to them, right? Whereas with uh, an intra-domain traffic or traffic that is uh, using mainly the microservice architecture for communication, the communication uh, is usually defined with the destination rules in a one-to-one -on -one -to -one manner. Right. So whichever service wants to communicate with uh, another service, you set up uh, the destination rule and, uh, uh, you know, any any sort of uh, rate limiting uh, in your policies and it is going to be set up for them. And because the consumers are usually part of the same team or part of the same working uh, on the same uh, cluster or within the same enterprise boundary, usually the, you are more, more concerned about uh, authentication of the traffic itself. So maybe you are limiting it based on uh, the IP from which the traffic originates, or uh, you know the different uh, namespaces which uh, from which the traffic originates, uh, rather than trying to authenticate uh, the users based on uh, you know say uh, their uh, user ID or user keys or what. Right? The contracts are more implicit. Now you are talking about uh, API interfaces that are going to be used. You're talking about more lower level protocols like uh, uh, gRPC that, you, that are going to be used. So the documentation also fairly informal. It, it could be within the code or it could be uh, that, you know, you have a, a, a small uh, a schema registry where you maintain um, your uh, data, different data types uh, that could be accessible by all of the developers. Uh, so they could see what the uh, data types are that they can use. Okay, so coming to the security paradigms then for API management and service mesh. So as I said, with service management, you're doing both authentication and authorization. And rate limiting is also one of the core factors of how you are going to control traffic and protect your backend. Okay, so the way that you do rate limiting here is uh, by formal plans and uh, by using uh, the gateway to set up uh, based on the number of transactions that you're going to allow. 
Okay, uh, API management security is mainly applicable at the layer seven, which is at the application layer. So you're talking more about uh, HTTP REST endpoints, and you know you're uh, using uh, HTTP security protocols like SSL and TLS to, to, to achieve that. You are uh, doing identity management, uh, you know, federated identity, uh, and uh, you know, uh, standard uh, internet application. Uh, security protocols like OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. And uh, you could use, uh, uh, you know, the, the JWT tokens that are generated using OAuth. You could use that to do token inspection and uh, uh, run your claim checks uh, before you allow uh, users to access that particular bank. Right. With service mesh, it is more about controlling traffic to the services. It's about uh, making sure that there is resilience in the service. That you know, you're not your service microservice that you have uh, developed and deployed. Uh, it is not being bombarded by hit. So you do uh, rate limiting based on. The, uh, the actual uh, uh, cap capacity of the service rather than uh, to protect uh, a particular endpoint for monetary reasons or for application plan reasons. Okay, so uh, in uh, so the uh, ability to reach the service is through uh, set up through your destination rules and Kubernetes ingresses. You could do whitelisting and blacklisting to control uh, not just what IPs uh, can uh, uh, can connect to your microservices, but also which projects or which namespaces within your cluster can connect to your uh, service, which uh, particular uh, uh, direction that uh, the uh, connections between the microservices can be, what version uh, are they allowed to use. So you control all of that level of uh, uh, communication between the services using your service mesh. So the security then that you set up is mostly at la layer four, which is at the network layer. So you are talking about uh, you know mutual TLS, uh, you know trusts, ciphers, you know using load balancing uh, between different uh, microservices, uh, so the, and uh, and then uh, on a on a larger point uh, beyond security to provide. Uh, observability and traceability of traffic across the uh, uh, across the microservice architecture okay with api management then uh, what you get is because you have external client applications connecting to it so it's very important that the security that you set up is uh, properly configured with the right set of uh, credentials that you could use so the simplest way is to just use an api key or a user key uh, so anytime a user signs up for uh, a particular uh, API uh, on your uh, API developer platform, they get a unique API key assigned and, and they use the key to make a request. Or you use uh, something like a basic auth, which is an API key pair. So there is a, a shared secret and a common client ID that you use. So basically the uh, app ID and an app key pair that you could use. Uh, this is a, uh, a more secure way of communicating it. Rather than using a single key that is uh, public, you use one public key and one private secret. And the third and most popular one for uh, enterprises and financial organizations to use OpenID Connect. Uh, so uh, this is based on OAuth 2. And uh, what it does is it allows you to not just control uh, the, uh, the actual uh, API, but also control how that identity is created and shared. So you know you could uh, provide a single sign-on with for the users. You could get the users uh, to be federated across from a different identity management platform that you're using. You, and because you, all you're sharing is a token uh, to the uh, to the API management platform, you don't need to share the actual identity of the user. Right, identity is authenticated by your identity manager, and uh, you, all you are doing here is you are letting the, uh, you know, letting the API gateway know that they, this is the token, this is a valid token, and I have the credentials to access it. 
okay and so in terms of then um, moving further to the access control so access controlling is uh, you know so authentication is the first step you know that the uh, that the customer is authenticated and is valid so access control is is he allowed to access this particular resource that i'm protecting okay so access control and uh, uh, so it it works at two levels works at the application itself uh, you know if you are using a client application to call the api or uh, you're doing user access control maybe based on a role you know maybe a a, a manager is allowed to access a particular uh, right method uh, you know for your uh, for your api but you don't want to give that permission to a, a developer so uh, you can inspect their uh, uh, role uh, and uh, depending on the role you could give them the right kind of access okay so very briefly i'll just talk a couple of minutes about uh, the service mesh use case that we're going to see and then i'm going to run into the demo okay so here you have got uh, a, a polyglot microservice uh, and uh, you know the way that microservice architecture works is you have an an, uh, an envoy with uh, deployed with each particular microservice that acts as a sidecar and that uh, allows for uh, enforcing the uh, uh, rules and policies that you have set up in uh, in your uh, istio istio control plane right so there is always uh, this data plane that you talk about where the actual request response traffic flows and a control plane where you set up policies and where you uh, have where you can do observing of your services and observing of your uh, traffic and uh, you know any uh, uh, any uh, policy uh, violations that are happening okay now what you do is when you introduce api management as we have said to communicate with your external audiences what will end up happening is api managers are also typically designed the same way you also have an uh, api manager control plane and an api gateway uh, data plane uh, right so which means that you're now your api consumers when they make a request to your apis they go through two hops right they have to go through your api gateway which enforces the api policies then the request reaches your ingress envoy where uh, it uh, it then reaches uh, and hits your uh, actual microservice uh, application which again the, has policies controlled by the istio control plane right so uh, this leads to uh, this is right in some cases where you want to strictly control and isolate the two different uh, control planes and the ability for you to manage both uh, uh, api management and service mesh completely separately but there is a better way which uh, red hat came up with wherein uh, you could have uh, you know the api management adapter that sits between your uh, istio control plane and the api manager plane and what it does is it pulls in all of the api management policies and capabilities into your istio control plane uh, which means that the in the data plane the policy enforcement happens in the ingress envoy just as you would do in a service mesh architecture but at the same time the uh, api is uh, defined and managed uh, in the api manager itself so it gives you the ability additionally to provide that uh, api documentation and uh, developer portal and uh, forums and everything else that you want uh, to do to make life easier for your api consumers so with this kind of architecture uh, your api consumers are, uh, uh, are not aware or don't care that you have uh, you're running a microservice architecture behind the scenes or you have this set of uh, istio control plane and destination rules who are set up they would be interacting with your apis using your api management portal and at the same time, your uh, internal uh, consumers, your service mesh uh, traffic, your microservice developers, they don't care that you have, uh, you know, an API management adapter and an API consumer that is using API management platform. They would be uh, using and communicating, uh, and setting up their policies using the service mesh in the Istio control plane directly. Okay. So yeah, without further ado, let me jump into the demo then. So as uh, we have seen so far with uh, uh, with uh, Rafael, he actually showed us that you know he has set up this uh, 
uh, this open API sandbox in an OpenShift cluster. Uh, I'm using the same cluster. What we are doing differently here is we actually, uh, he showed you how with the open API uh, uh, banking sandbox, we are, uh, we are setting up this uh, mock APIs that you could use to, uh, to, uh, to play around with your APIs, right? To try out your APIs and samples using Micros. Now here, what we have done is we have gone a step further and we have actually uh, configured and uh, and uh, actually implemented two of these apis a current account api and a position keeping transactions api both of them as microservices okay and these are uh, controlled uh, within my micro my, my service mesh that i have deployed here so you could see uh, if i uh, go into one of my uh, apis here you could see my uh, API uh, and you know how the traffic is uh, in uh, in that particular uh, microservice architecture. Okay, so the so uh, and what I have done differently is I have this uh, two these two different uh, API uh, APIs, which means that I have set them up so that they have uh, two different routes to access it. So, okay, so the, my current account, the gateway to access it uh, is uh, set up uh, by my Istio system to use this. And uh, and if I actually set up uh, and make a call to my service account, you could see that I get a response back. This is uh, controlled by my service mesh. So, and if you see my uh, Istio configuration, you would see that uh, I have uh, my, uh, a destination rule setup uh, for my uh, account gateway here, I, and this is what uh, controls uh, the host and uh, what port of uh, what particular uh, uh, what particular uh, service virtual service it is going to connect to. Okay, so that is how uh, Istio is set up. So right now, this is how the communication between uh, within my microservice architecture works. What I have done is I've taken the same accounts API and I have set up an API for you, okay? Uh, and in the API, what I have done is in the backend, uh, I have set up this accounts backend, okay? Which is the same uh, Istio system endpoint that is being exposed by my, uh, by my platform, okay? And what I have also done is I have set up a unique policy for this particular account, which does a role check. Okay, so it whitelists any uh, any methods where my resource is uh, controlled and it is only going to allow someone who is an employee to actually uh, uh, to actually access this. Okay, so I'm going to up, up, so up, uh, upload this, and when I do this. What you could see here is now I could try to make a call to that uh, endpoint that is exposed by my uh, uh, by my application, um, uh, my staging application here, which is this particular endpoint. Okay, and uh, what I need to do is I first need to get an access token, get a new access token. So I start off as a developer. And what this is doing is this is doing the authorization using uh, uh, using the auth authorization code flow from uh, what. And once I do that, I get the response back from here. Okay, and uh, uh, so this is this is an example of how I am getting this working using the two-step uh, gateway. So there is an uh, API gateway, and then uh, this is uh, leading to the Istio endpoint gateway that you have used at the back end. So interesting uh, thing is I picked the other example, the other API that I have created, my transactions API, right? So my idea is, yes, who is you going to use my transactions API? My partners, right, who themselves have their own development teams and who are aware that, you know, they could uh, manage the manage the endpoints, uh, endpoints on their own. So what I have done is uh, instead of setting up that uh, uh, backends and controlling the backend uh, to the to that particular endpoint, 
what I have done is I have set it up uh, so that uh, it is going to uh, control that particular uh, API directly through the three scale adapter. So as you can see, uh, it, uh, it in involves that particular three scale handler in between, which tells it that uh, it is not an authorized uh, transaction. So if I find traces here, you could see here that uh, Istio mixer gets involved and uh, a three scale Istio mixer gets involved, which actually uh, uh, logs uh, an error because I did not pass the user key that is needed for me to connect to this particular endpoint. Now, what do I do is if I provide that particular user key, I get the response back. So what, what has happened here is uh, using the same uh, uh, service mesh and the same Istio control plane, I am injecting the uh, application plans and rules that I have set up within my three scale API manager. So the uh, rules for communication, the uh, application plans that I have set up here are actually coming from here. The user key is coming from here. Okay, and this this particular thing, this particular uh, uh, user uh, flow is validated uh, on the uh, Istio ingress itself. Okay, so what you can see here is uh, I get all of the capabilities of my API management platform uh, and my ability to choose which particular backend endpoints I could directly uh, uh, set up as APIs and expose them to my users. And at the same time, I get the uh, facility to control which methods uh, you know, are rate limited, setting up the overall architecture of using open ID connect, identity management, everything else that you associate with API management, I could bring that in, okay? So with that, uh, I, I hope you could see, so very brief presentation, but I hope you could see uh, what I was uh, trying to uh, show you with this demo, with what me and Rafael wanted to communicate across. Uh, and uh, I think we have about four minutes left. Uh, if you have any questions. I think you could either use your uh, uh, audio or if you prefer, you could ask uh, on the chat and uh, me and Rafael will try to respond to it. Yeah, in, meanwhile, we take some questions, uh, Satya. I think that worth mentioning, uh, <clears throat> that these capabilities uh, are available on OpenShift and Triscale for on-prem, but also on, on, on public clouds by deploying uh, OpenShift and, and Triscale, but as well in the managed services, right? So all these capabilities are, are available for uh, to really uh, rapidly starting up for the development and in, in experimentation on on APIs and of course core banking, uh, protecting core banking APIs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there are uh, uh, there are uh, uh, with the Red Hat's hybrid cloud model, you have the ability to uh, deploy it on premise in your own private cloud. Uh, use one of the public cloud providers uh, with the certified OpenShift that is available. Use our SaaS platform and sign up to threescale.net. And we also have a managed service that uh, that runs on an OpenShift dedicated, uh, which is 100% uh, supported and managed by Red Hat. You only manage your APIs. So uh, hybrid, we cover all bases. However, you want to come uh, to control your uh, development environment and your APIs. And uh, uh, more details are actually available in the uh, booth. So if you visit the Red Hat booth, there is a slide deck which uh, gives you some uh, resources and uh, you know some uh, uh, links to get started with Rescale. Okay. 
okay yeah looks like we, we don't have any questions uh, so i just want to thank everyone for coming and for uh, sticking around uh, here uh, there are good resources in our resource page and we will also be sharing this uh, slide deck i think you will get it from uh, uh, from api days uh, in an email in a couple of weeks uh, and uh, you know yeah we really enjoyed presenting here and i hope uh, you all found this useful rafael everyone thanks sachya bye yeah. yeah okay thank you everyone thank you